We move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 4070 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the Scottish approach to managing the global risk of antimicrobial resistance. And I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Hamza Youssef to speak to and move the motion up to 10 minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And at the beginning of my contribution, let me move the motion in my name. Over the past few years, Presiding Officer, we have understood what it means to be faced with a health crisis that at first we couldn't treat. Uh, and we've seen its impact on so many areas of our lives. But what happens if many more infections couldn't be treated? What if antibiotics no longer work to protect patients while they are undergoing surgery or chemotherapy. In reality, of course, this is what could happen if antimicrobial resistance, AMR, was allowed to rise uncontrolled. Today's debate on this important global issue is the first in the history of devolution. And uh, I don't use that term global threat lightly. AMR is a, a global threat. I want us all to be under no illusion whatsoever about the severity uh, of that threat. The World Health Organization has described the rise of antimicrobial resistance as one of the top 10 global health threats facing humanity. Uh, the Lancet estimates that there was almost 5 million deaths in 2019 associated with bacterial AMR, and of these, 1.27 million directly caused by antimicrobial resistance. But there are things we can do to address this threat. And today I want to focus on three key ways we can contain it. Uh, firstly, through our people. By not only recognising the extraordinary efforts of those already working in this field in Scotland, but looking into the future and thinking about those who we will need to help us combat AMR. Uh, secondly, through information flows to address any problem, of course, we must understand the nature of it. And so I'll talk about how we gather and share that data uh, domestically, of course, but also internationally, and, 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 the, and the rationale and the need to do that. And finally, by recognising the global nature of the issue, AMR, of course, we know doesn't recognise borders, and so I'll talk a little bit about our international-facing work uh, in this regard. Uh, AMR, we know, doesn't just spread between humans across borders and around the world. It can develop and spread via animals and, indeed, the environment too. I'll speak about the people and information flows across health and social care and our work with global partners. In closing the debate, my colleague Marie Todd will give some focus on our work in animal health and the environment. We need action in all of these sectors, working together to control and contain AMR, taking a One Health approach to the problem. In terms of our people, I want to first talk about uh, all of those who are involved in are helping us to tackle AMR, because they are absolutely critical uh, to our success in containing it. AMR control starts with infection prevention. Every time we use an antimicrobial drug, there's a chance for resistance to develop. So health professionals across Scotland work hard to prevent as many infections as possible and control them quickly when they happen. This not only helps the patient of today, but also avoids the use of some drugs altogether, helping to keep them uh, keep them working for the patients of tomorrow. But sadly, as we know, not every infection can be prevented. When infections do occur, we need to use our life-saving antimicrobial drugs in the most appropriate and the most effective way. As a government, we have invested in specialist antimicrobial pharmacists, healthcare scientists and researchers who all work together to get the right drug to the right patient at the right time. The right diagnostic tests undertaken promptly in our laboratories can help identify the right drug for a patient's particular infection and protect important treatments for the future. In Scotland, we are fortunate to have groundbreaking organisations leading the way on AMR. The Scottish Antimicrobial Prescribing Group, a consortium of prescribers from within the NHS, published regular guidance and educational materials for their colleagues on the best possible use of antibiotics and other antimicrobial drugs. They have continued this critically important task alongside their clinical work throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. With their help, spotting opportunities for good stewardship of these drugs can be part of every health and care professional's job. But we are not just thinking about how to tackle this issue with our current workforce, as important as that is. A long-term problem, of course, requires long-term planning. So we are also taking stock of our ongoing specialist workforce 
and staffing needs, building on the lessons learned during the pandemic by the infection prevention and control, antimicrobial stewardship and health protection workforces. We are working hard to determine and address our evolving service needs. This workforce not only safeguards antimicrobials, but also supports health and social care in the prevention and control of existing and new emergent infections, which is, of course, critically important to any future pandemic. Uh, every effective workforce needs to have appropriate data to manage their task, and our clinicians have shown strong leadership in collecting surveillance data on this issue. In Scotland, we have the uniquely wide-ranging Scottish One Health Antimicrobial Use and Antimicrobial Resistance Report. It's published every year in November to coincide with World Antibiotic Awareness Week. This covers humans, animals, the environment and the food chain. It's hugely important to our understanding of AMR. Only with the accurate and most up-to-date information can we keep track of how resistance is changing, evolving and continually guide our health system towards the best possible treatments to use. But we want to go further. Learning from the COVID-19 pandemic, Scotland needs and deserves a, a Once for Scotland electronic surveillance system for infection. This could support patients, help staff at the front line of infection control and, of course, underpin our important AMR work. I have asked my officials to start looking into the best system for Scotland. Of course, I will. Sanders Gohani. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Whilst this is very important, would it, is it also not very important that we have communication between healthcare staff that actually can talk to each other and we're all able to see each other's notes? Cabinet Secretary. It's, it's, a, it's a very important issue raised by Dr. Sanders Gohani. Of course, he has first. Uh, hand experience uh, in, in, in his uh, clinical role. It is why we have uh, published our uh, data strategy for health and social care. I would commend it to uh, Dr Sanders Kohani, indeed anybody in the chamber. And it talks importantly, not of necessarily uprooting every single IT system right across health and social care, but creating that cloud-based uh, infrastructure, which I think is going to be critically important for sharing the information uh, that he uh, talks uh, about. Uh, of course, I will. Michael Mara. Thank you for taking the intervention. Uh, the, talking about surveillance and issues of stewardship, is the third leg of the tripod not discovery and the fact that we need new interventions? And will the minister or the, uh, the other minister cover this in the speech? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, of course, we will cover that aspect. And I should say, and I was going to come to this at the, the end of my uh, contribution, that is why uh, I am keen to accept the amendment by Jackie Bailey and by Scottish Labour, because I think it is very important that that work is done around research and the various different research streams that exist. So uh, I think it was a very good amendment, and that is why we will be accepting it uh, later on uh, today. Uh, the last point I really wanted to touch upon, uh, Presiding Officer, was the global nature of the issue that we are dealing with. It is a global crisis. Uh, AMR. Uh, it leaves no part of the world un unaffected, so it requires a global response. Scotland is rising to meet that shared challenge. Like climate change, AMR is an issue which does not respect borders. Resistant microbes can and do spread widely via the environment, via people, animals, which all travel. We work closely on this issue with colleagues from all four UK no na nations. In fact, I will be attending a ministerial roundtable on AMR with my colleagues from the other UK nations uh, next month. With them, we will be discussing uh, a new way to incentivise pharmaceutical companies with a view to encouraging them to invest in research and development for new antimicrobials. Uh, Scottish experts have also played a leading role in the development of the UK's National Action Plan in AMR, which runs from 2019 to 2024. The University of Strathclyde is undertaking some of the key research and modelling work underpinning the delivery of this plan and the contribution made by infection prevention and control. But I take the point that Michael Mara raised just a moment ago. There are various pieces of work and important that we get an understanding of that landscape, bring that uh, work together uh, in a collaborative way. And that is why, as I said, uh, already we will be supporting uh, the Labour amendment in relation uh, to the, work that the, the, the role that the Scottish Funding Council uh, could play in that regard. Uh, but we also look much further afield. Like climate change, of course, AMR is a threat to the achievement of the sustainable development goals and to the hopes and aspirations of millions. And that is why we look to work uh, globally on this issue. To give one example, the Scottish Antimicrobial Prescribing Group has worked in partnership with Ghanaian colleagues for several years, helping to improve antimicrobial prescribing and practice in Ghanaian hospitals. We are now considering what further we can do as part of Scotland's international development work. Um, let me also just say that, on, on, on a note of slight disappointment, uh, that the free trade agreements that have been concluded by the UK government since the EU exit have been lacking in ambition on AMR. So my ministerial colleagues 
have written to the UK Government to express Scotland's regret on this issue and to push the UK Government, perhaps in future uh, free trade agreements, uh, to, 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 to uh, increase their ambition in this uh, respect. In conclusion, uh, Presiding uh, Officer, I suspect that most people in the country probably haven't heard of the threat AMR poses. Why would they? But given the severity of the potential impact of AMR, we have a collective duty to raise awareness of the dangers of antimicrobial resistance. We all have a role to play. All of us can listen to our health care and veterinary professionals and take, the, take their advice on whether we, uh, whether our family members, our cats, our dogs, do they really need that antibiotic? We can take unused drugs back to the pharmacy, will they be properly disposed of and not end up in our environment? AMR is an enormous challenge. It requires uh, to tackle it requires conscientiousness, creativity in health and social care, in veterinary surgeries and on farms, in laboratories and when working with international partners. It requires professionals from different sectors and backgrounds to work closely uh, together. We have been doing that in Scotland. And despite the threat of resistance and the many ways it can spread, uh, what is happening in Scotland is a positive story. But there is much more uh, to do. As I said uh, in, in, in the body of my speech, uh, Presiding Officer, we do intend to accept Labour's uh, amendment today. I look forward to what will be undoubtedly a very thoughtful and considered debate. Thank you. Before we move on to the next contribution, the Chamber will wish to be aware that there is time to give time back for any interventions. Um, I now call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and move amendment 4070.1. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And whilst I absolutely understand the importance of discussing the global risk of antimicrobial resistance, this debate was supposed to be a chance to discuss the impact of long COVID in Scotland. And I hope the Presiding Officer will allow me just a little latitude to mention this first before turning to the substance of the debate today. And in doing so, I note that the One Health approach to tackling antimicrobial resistance was actually adopted in Scotland in 2016. The Government have had six years to bring forward a debate, but have not done so until now, not once in that entire six-year period. The situation surrounding long COVID could not be more urgent, and for the 132,000 people across Scotland living with the condition, this debate would have provided much needed information and indeed, can I say, impetus for the Scottish Government to act. This would have been the opportunity for the Scottish Government, let, let me finish and then by all means, this would have been the opportunity for the Scottish Government to tell us whether they have finally spent any of the £10 million announced for long COVID treatment seven months ago and to share what research they have done on the condition since we first learned about it two years ago. And I suspect that's the reason the debate has been cancelled. There have been few bids for the money because health boards are too busy fighting the latest wave of COVID, which is overwhelming our hospitals. Perhaps just giving them the money to get on with making provision is the best thing to do, rather than trying to micromanage help for long COVID sufferers who in the meantime have to suffer for even longer. Instead, this debate was changed at the very last minute. Scared of criticism, political spin at the forefront of their consideration, the SNP government cancelled the debate. They made the wrong decision. In truth, both date debates are required. I will give way to the Cabinet Secretary and then I'll turn to antimicrobial resistance. Cabinet Secretary. I can thank Jackie Billy for giving way. I, I do uh, regret the characterisation, which I think is inaccurate, that she's putting uh, on why this debate is coming forward. It is not unusual for business to be revised. The debate has not been cancelled. It will take place in a few weeks' time. And the reason for that is precisely because the detail that Ms Bailey is rightly asking for, we will be able to put into the public domain at that time in a few weeks, which is what she wants, which is what stakeholders want. To so suggest this debate has been cancelled, uh, I think, is incorrect, and it will uh, take place subject to Parliament, Parliament's agreement, of course, in the next few weeks. I, I simply say, presiding officer, people will look at the record. They will see that we have waited six years for a debate on antimicrobial resistance. Um, and, you know, there's not been anything in that entire time. But a long COVID debate, which is about people now experiencing the most dreadful symptoms and not getting treatment, is put off to some point in the future. If left unchecked, though, resistance to antimicrobial drugs could have long-lasting and profound effects on global health. Routine surgeries like hip replacements, organ transplants would become less safe. Childbirth would be more dangerous. And a number of infections like UTIs, pneumonia, tuberculosis could become harder to treat or require a stay in hospital. 
A report published late last year found that the total use of antibiotics in Scotland had fallen by 17.1% in the last five years. That is positive progress. However, the report also found that antibiotic use in hospitals is rising and is up by 2.3% since 2016. Despite the stats showing that use of antibiotics has generally decreased, it is important to recognise that COVID-19 may have altered this picture. Whilst antimicrobial usage has decreased in primary care, there have been increases in prescribing by dentists, for example, due to limited options for dental treatment during the pandemic. It's also important to consider greater public awareness of infection prevention over the last two years, including hand washing and mask wearing, and an overall decrease in socialising, which has reduced infection transmission. But this isn't an issue reserved to Scotland, or one that simply can be fixed by a Scottish approach. Antimicrobial resistance is prevalent across the globe, with countries in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia experiencing the highest death rate. In Europe, rates of resistance in the South are greater than those in the North. And as we've seen over the course of the pandemic, the spread of virus and bacteria is not stopped at a border. If the global spread of disease is coupled with antimicrobial resistance, then there is the threat of future pandemics. The government must have plans in place to support our NHS and care sector. Scotland's hospitals are already under great strain. Patients are waiting for up to eight hours to be seen in accident and emergency, and we know from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine that there is clear evidence that long waits in emergency departments are directly associated with patient death. We must therefore act to prevent antimicrobial resistance from impacting on the NHS in the future. As antimicrobial resistance makes infections more difficult to treat and leads to longer hospital stays, the NHS will be faced with higher medical costs and increased mortality. So it is right for us to cooperate across the UK and globally to deal with this. When the MRSA crisis posed a similar threat over a decade ago, Scottish Labour took action, which was then followed up by the SNP. We established a system of national mandatory surveillance of MRSA, developed the introduction of an antimicrobial resistance strategy, created new standards for hospital infection control and cleaning services, and invested in better facilities for decontaminating reusable medical devices. These steps were delivered quickly and effectively, and were the difference between life and death for many people. The World Health Organization ranks antimicrobial resistance as one of the 10 greatest global public health threats facing humanity. They've highlighted the concerning development of multi- and pan-resistant bacteria that causes infections which are currently untreatable. As we come out of the pandemic, and many people are left with weakened immune systems, um, then we are in danger of long-term health problems such as long COVID um, interacting with untreatable diseases, which of course is a cause for concern. Labour's amendment seeks not just to highlight, but to support the Scottish research environment. There is much work being done by Scottish research groups in the key themes of surveillance, stewardship and discovery. We do know that the share of Research Council income peaked in 2012-13, um, but has declined since. We are now, of course, outside of the formal EU research environment and must do everything we can to rebuild the collaborations internationally and the partnerships across the UK that are so critical to advancing research in antimicrobial resistance. Tasking the Scottish Funding Council with a rapid review of resource options is a simple yet impactful step. 18 higher education institutions in Scotland already conduct research in this area, and that is welcome. The Scottish Government should outline what financial support it can give to ensure that Scotland is on the front foot when it comes to dealing with this looming crisis. How much funding is actually being allocated for this work? The NHS must also be given the research and development capacity and funding required to effectively tackle this issue, to monitor microbiological data, to train and educate staff in these issues as well. World Health Organization scientists are concerned that COVID-19 has caused greater inappropriate use of antibiotics, which makes the risk of antimicrobial resistance greater still. Those in care homes with specific needs 
are particularly susceptible. I hope that the Scottish Government will make sure that the rise of antimicrobial resistance is addressed within our care homes at pace. We cannot allow residential care to become the ground zero of antimicrobial resistance. It is real. It is a threat to modern medicine. And it is important that this government acts now to fund research and prepare the health service and our care sector for all eventualities. We need to learn from the mistakes made during the pandemic to ensure that Scotland is not caught once again on the back foot. I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for support for the Labour Amendment, and I therefore move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I now call on Sandesh Gulhani. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I refer members to my register of interest. I'm a practising NHS doctor and probably the only one here that can legally prescribe antibiotics. Today's debate... I'm also a prescriber. <laughs> <laughs> said probably. Today's debate is very important in its own right, and I believe there is consensus across Parliament on much of our approach to tackling antimicrobial resistance. That said, the Scottish Government's motion, like so many others, is somewhat self-congratulatory and doesn't call for any specific action, and that is why, like the SNP, we will be supporting the Labour Amendment. Before drilling into this, however, I would like to pay respect to over 130,000 Scots who are struggling with a debilitating condition that we were supposed to be addressing today, before the SNP Green Government pulled the debate from the schedule. We only received the revised agenda about two days ago, a move that didn't go unnoticed by so many people up and down the country who are struggling with long COVID and still waiting for this government to deliver a credible action plan. The Cabinet Secretary says that this is to allow the government to make an announcement. Well, I've been talking about long COVID since I got here, and it's been eight months since the Cabinet Secretary announced money, and yet we are still apparently not ready for this debate. We look forward to the discussions which will be coming after the elections. For today's revised business, we're focusing on Scotland's approach to managing the global risk of antimicrobial resistance, or AMR. And I'd like to start by travelling back some 94 years, before Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin in 1928, an infection from a simple cut could mean the end of life. There was a medical history game changer with the invention of penicillin. In fact, there was a famous case where a surgeon was performing an amputation of a limb. This one surgery killed three people. The patient, the surgical assistant who was holding down the patient and was cut, and the surgeon himself who managed to nick himself on his blade. And all of this because of the inability to treat the infection. But why? It's because when antibiotics kill bacteria, there is a chance through a random mutation, like we see in the COVID virus, that this mutation allows the bacteria to evade the antibiotics and gives it an advantage. And so it profiles, it reproduces, and then it dominates. As antibiotics lose their ability to kill strains of microbes, and if we cannot deliver new drugs that can beat those bugs, then by the year 2050, we can expect about 10 million deaths per year worldwide from drug-resistant infections. 10 million deaths every year in under 30s. That would be more than today's deaths from cancer and diabetes combined. Back in 2013, seven years before COVID, the UK Secretary's Agency Chief Medical Advisor, Dr. Susan Hopkins, said AMR was a catastrophic threat. She said, if we don't act now, any one of us could go into hospital in 20 years for minor surgery and could die because of an ordinary infection that can't be treated by antibiotics. And routine operations like hip replacements or organ transplants could be deadly because of the risk of infection. Could you imagine a return to the days when childbirth a cut in the arm, or even an insect bite could give rise to a serious risk of death. This might seem far-fetched now, but did we heed the warnings about a possible respiratory pandemic? In fact, we're not working fast enough to deal with long COVID. Warren Buffett once said, what we learn from history is that people don't learn from history. I do hope that AMR and long COVID, he's wrong. Presiding officer, we simply cannot allow ourselves to emerge from the COVID pandemic and enter into another crisis, AMR or indeed long COVID. AMR infections are causing an estimated 700,000 deaths each year globally. 
In the UK, MR causes an estimated 12,000 deaths per year. It was reported recently that antibiotic resistance increased by 4.9 per cent between 2016 and 2020. This means one in five people with a bloodstream infection in 2020 has an infection with an antibiotic resistant, a potentially life-threatening situation. There are now strains of tuberculosis that are resistant to almost all lines of treatment. TB deaths have increased for the first time in a decade, and global targets are no longer on, on track. When I was on my infectious diseases rotation, I remember seeing a patient who was stuck in a small negative pressure room. He was stuck there for months and months and months because he had a multi-drug resistant TB strain. His mental health was awful. He was sick because of the severity of the side effects of the antibiotics he was forced to be given. So what are we doing about AMR? Well, clinicians are reducing their antibiotic risk and use where possible, and GPs have decreased prescribing by 20% since 2016, but over the same period, we've seen a 2.3% increase in hospitals. So why can't we just come up with new drugs to replace the ones that don't work anymore? Unfortunately, it's not that easy. No new class of antibiotic have been developed since 1987, and the market for antimicrobials is frankly broken. Developing new antibiotics is massively expensive. In fact, there are just 40 antibiotics in clinical trials globally. The problem is compounded by the fact that new antibiotics should, and they should be, used sparingly. And this endangers the risk to return ratio. To overcome the high failure rate of new antimicrobials, the UK government has stepped in and developed an innovative solution that's now being tested. The model moves away from paying for individual packs of antimicrobials towards an annual payment based on the health benefits to patients and the value it adds to the NHS. The new subscription style payment is a win-win for the NHS and for industry. Patients can benefit from a secure supply of potentially new antimicrobial drugs, while pharmaceutical companies can reliably forecast a return on their investment. The UK government is also committed to invest in health research, increasing public research and development investment to record levels, equating to 20 billion by 2025, an increase of around a quarter in real terms. I take it that the Cabinet Secretary welcomes this commitment. In Scotland, we're fortunate here to have expert intelligence, evidence-based guidance, clinical assurance and clinical leadership. National Services Scotland has a dedicated department to reducing the burden of infection and antimicrobial resistance, and its experts are represented on the UK's Advisory Committee on Antimicrobial Prescribing Resistance and Healthcare-Associated Infection. This is a four-nation body that provides practical and scientific advice to the UK and devolved governments on minimising the risk of healthcare-associated and drug-resistant infections. I'm interested to know if the Cabinet Secretary shares my view that AMR and indeed other pressing health crises that may emerge are best tackled on a four-nation basis, not just a Scottish data and research solution, but a four-nation one. In 2019, the UK and, development and, and devolved government set out a joint vision to contain and control AMR by 2040. This is supported by a five-year national action plan with clear targets. The, com the commitment is serious to reducing the need for antimicrobials by lowering the burden of infection in our communities in the NHS, on farms and in the environment. This One Health approach has seen antibiotic use in farmed animals decrease by 52% since 2014 with a decrease of 79% in sales of veterinary antibiotics for the most critical ones used in human health. And the UK plays a leading role in tackling AMR on the world stage, as witnessed when Britain used its G7 presidency to secure ambitious commitment on AMR to strengthen the resilience of antibiotic supply chains and develop sustainable, clean and green solutions for antibiotic manufacturing. Presiding officer, AMR is a global problem that requires global action. But this is not the time to pat ourselves on the back. We can't be distracted. Our children would never forgive us if we fail. We must step up our efforts to work seamlessly across the UK to ensure we deliver on the national five-year plan and control AMR by 2040. In doing so, we can ensure Scotland's world-class expertise maximises its contribution to global research efforts through the UK and international research partnerships. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. I would be grateful if <coughs> members who wish to take part in the debate could press their request to speak buttons. And I call Emma Roddick to be followed by Michael Mara. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
Um, anyone who works or has worked in the NHS or indeed knows someone who spends a lot of time in hospital or care homes will understand the massive importance of tackling antimicrobial resistance. I admit that back in 2022, when we first started putting antibacterial gel on everything, I, I did feel a bit anxious about what that and the inevitable group of people who, no matter what doctors tell them, insist amoxicillin somehow makes their viral infection go away more quickly, might do to bolster the other slower pandemic. I think it's important now to reiterate what the Scottish Government, what health advisors and what many others have been saying weekly for these last few years, that washing your hands is the best thing that you can do to prevent spreading viruses. Washing for 40 seconds will prevent bacteria from developing that resistance, and overuse of hand sanitizer might do the opposite. Anti-infectives like antibacterial spray and hand sanitizer do have their place in hospitals and in homes where there's an active infection, for example, but they are also something that deserve real consideration in tackling AMR. Indeed, reducing unintentional exposure to these is a policy within the five-year action plan that we've signed up to. Using these more responsibly may have been quite a diff difficult circle to square in the peaks of the pandemic, but now is probably a good time to start educating people better and encouraging them to read the labels, use the appropriate kind of sanitizer and stick to hand washing when possible. We desperately need to be able to rely on disinfectants and other anti-infectives in hospital, and it is just not worth risking that to save 40 seconds of your time. We also have to be able to trust that when we are prescribed antibiotics, we need antibiotics. So the reduction in un unnecessary antibiotic use drew to an increased awareness of an action against AMR, as well as research which has provided better knowledge of when antibiotics are not needed, is a key part of building that trust. Similarly, we have to be able to trust that when we need antibiotics, those antibiotics are going to work. And that's only going to continue as long as everyone honours their responsibility to preserve the effectiveness of these drugs. What the Scottish Government needs to do, and what we've heard from the Cabinet Secretary this afternoon is doing, is to make sure that the public are armed with the knowledge that they need to understand when antibiotics are simply not useful and why AMR is a very real threat to our future healthcare standards. What's heartening for me to see is that Scotland's efforts in tackling AMR are already showing strong results. We've cut post-surgical deaths and have a patient safety record amongst the best in the world. And it's right that part of Scotland's approach to managing this risk is signing up to the UK's five-year action plan and 20-year vision. Working closely together with other countries in the UK on a global issue alongside in-house efforts like our world-leading patient safety programme is exactly the sort of international cooperation that Scotland should seek to nurture. Post-Brexit, it is more important than ever to build links and share knowledge, funding and efforts. Resistance anywhere in the world poses a risk to Scotland and the UK, and it's a global effort that is required here to overcome it. So I'm glad to see Scottish Labour's amendment recognise this, and I'll be happy to support their position on the Scottish Funding Council reviewing funding streams available to our universities and research groups at decision time. Whatever constitutional situation Scotland is in, cooperation is vital. The Scottish approach to work with other countries to promote best practice and work closely together to tackle AMR is undoubtedly the right one to take, and I look forward to seeing the trend of better managing antimicrobial resistance continue. Thank you. And I now call on Michael Mara to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr Mara. Thank you, President Officer, um, and uh, my, my compliments to uh, Emma Roderick. I think a, a fine speech with practical advice about the way that we can all contribute to um, tackling um, AMR, and we appreciate her uh, particular support um, on, on those comments for, for Labour's amendment. I mean, AMR um, is uh, antimicrobial resistance is, as people have already said, near the top of most lists of global risks that we face collectively. But then so was a pandemic. Um, and our preparedness, both in Scotland and internationally, was chronically limited. And some of the exercises that we undertook were insufficient uh, in preparing for that. Um, and we have to take these big global warnings an awful lot more seriously. Because we should be clear on this, that nobody and nowhere is doing enough to deal with this issue. And in my conversations uh, with uh, clinical and research colleagues in recent days on this subject, um, that has been made clear to me time and time again. There have been limited progress in different places. But the pandemic has been a huge displacement 
um, for our scientific and medical community in terms of their focus on other issues. Um, and uh, rightly so, that is entirely appropriate that that effort was, um, was put in. But we know that there has been a lack of progress as a, or, or, as a result on AMR. And it's, this is just one of many, many deep and hidden consequences and opportunity costs that come from dealing with the global ramifications of the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, but the warnings, as other people have already pointed out, are nothing new. The great Scottish scientist Sir Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin, the first antibiotic, actually spoke of microbial resistance in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize in 1945. And that was four, sorry, five years after resistance was first detected. And he specifically highlighted the issue of underdosing. So using a limited and low level amount of uh, what might be viewed as prophylactic, uh, uh, antibiotics uh, and actually rendering those ineffective over a period of time. So the, the analysis, as we pointed out, is nothing new. Because for many, the idea that childbirth routine surgery, as little as a cut finger, as uh, colleagues have been pointed out, could result in death is unimaginable. But for many across the world, that is still the lived experience. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And the advances that were unleashed by Fleming and his many collaborators and su successors have transformed health systems across the world, and they have held out the promise of more certain, happier lives to billions. But the retreat of the broad applicability of antibiotics risks global costs estimated at $100 trillion by 2050. Over 1 million people currently die globally as a result of antimicrobial resistance today. And if we do nothing or continue on the current course, that looks set to reach 10 million lives lost per year, eclipsing the 8 million lost to cancer. The O'Neill report uh, was issued in 2017, and that was a call to arms um, that was, uh, it was uh, requested by then Prime Minister David Cameron, probably this in my view, the most incompetent Prime Minister this country has seen in over 200 years, um, is actually, um, there's probably one, and I, I would say, and actually in competition with the current incumbent also, um, but one of the very few positive things to be issued. But I do think that our work in surveillance, stewardship and discovery have been utterly critical, and as a country with highly advanced medical and research infrastructure, it's incumbent on us to do more. But the result of that report in 2017, the response to it, has been nowhere near commensurate to the scale of the threat that was identified. And I want to, in my last few seconds, and likely, highlight some of the outstanding research being done in our universities. I'm keen to draw attention to the work of Professor James Chalmers at the University of Dundee, who's become a familiar figure on our TV screens due to his vital work on the COVID pandemic. He and his research team is having global impact. And prior to the emergence of COVID-19, his studies included phase one and phase two studies on non-antibiotic alternative therapies for respiratory infections, diagnostics to reduce antibiotic use, and much more. And I would would have been citing Professor Chalmers' work today had the promised long COVID debate been delivered. His research is, research is proving the high prevalence and debilitating nature of that condition and the various groups for whom it is of a particular risk. But I think that that is actually an illustration of the displacement of the pandemic and the, the result and the impact on our um, research communities and why actually it is important and we are grateful for the support of the Scottish Government and other parties for the amendment we have today. Because this work is vital uh, if we ensure that AMR is not just put on track as it was previously, but is reinvigorated and accelerated. So we are keen to have that health check on the research environment that has been blown off course. And we have to acknowledge as a parliament the fact our universities have lost their lead in research funding capture over the last decade, which, in, uh, as Jackie Bailey pointed out in 2013, was up to a 10 per cent lead across the rest of the UK. And we are now in a situation of parity. So that analysis by the Scottish Funding Council should focus on surveillance stewardship, but it must focus on discovery too. The idea that new therapies can be put in place. And we can be proud and hopeful uh, that the Drug Discovery Unit at the University of Dundee, again, the most influential institution on the pharmaceuticals industry in the entire world, is turning its guns on antimicrobial resistance by developing entirely new kinds of drugs. So our Scottish Government should be doing everything in its power to support these efforts and avoid the terrible and unfortunately very predictable consequences of failure. Thank you. I now call Fulton McGregor to be followed by David Torrance. Mr McGregor. Yeah, thank you, President Officer, uh, for the opportunity to speak in this very important debate. As others have said, Scotland has always proudly been at the forefront of revolutionary scientific breakthroughs. And it was, of course, a Scotsman, Alexander Fleming, who pioneered research into antimicrobials almost 100 years ago. In the century since Dr Fleming's work, innumerable lives have been saved thanks to the discovery of, of these antibiotics. 
and it is impossible to put an exact figure on this statement, but as the Cabinet Secretary said, the World Health Organisation estimated that antimicrobial, antimicrobials eh, have added roughly 20 years to global life expectancy. And for many, these have seemed to be a miracle cure. And while this sentiment may be true, it is a double-edged sword, as we have heard today. Over-reliance on these treatments can encourage evolutionary pressure, favouring antimicrobial resistant organisms. Indeed, the WHO noted that in 2019, 1.27 million global deaths were attributed to ineffective treatments due to AMR. Even for less severe ailments and conditions, AMR can lead to longer recovery times, resulting in lengthier hospital stays, higher medical costs for our NHS, and prolonged suffering for patients. And I think the Dr. Gohani made that point very well. Tackling the issue of, of, this, of AMR must remain a key priority for the Scottish Government and our NHS. I am proud to say that Scotland has already been a world leader in fighting antimicrobial resistance, and this must continue. Both the Scottish Government and the NHS Scotland contribute to the UK Government's five-year action plan 2019-2024. This action plan is a stepping stone for the aim that by 2040, AMR will be effectively contained and controlled through strong mitigation. It is important to emphasise that the plan does not foresee the eradication of AMR, as this, by definition, as an ever-evolving issue that requires constant vigilance. A key step taken by Scotland that came from this action plan was the establishment of the Scottish One Health National AMR Action Plan Group. This group works in collaboration with UK and European colleagues in conducting research to understand the risk factors for developing new antimicrobials, as well as research into the effectiveness of interventions aiming to drive behavioural change around their use amongst healthcare professionals and the general public. And I mentioned that Scotland has been a world leader in fighting AMR, and this is evident through examining Scotland's patient safety programme, which was, which was introduced in 2008. The programme is a national quality improvement scheme that aims to improve the safety and reliability of care and reduce harm. Importantly for this debate, a key facet of the programme is ensuring that patients are treated responsibly and safely with the right medicines across a wide range of care settings. And since implementation of this programme, the number of hospital and post-surgical deaths and complications have been cut significantly. Two major illnesses, MRSA and C. diff, that have direct links to AMR, have seen their numbers fall year on year since the programme began. And there are three methods presiding officer in which the Scottish Government can continue the mitigation of AMR. The first is, of course, to reduce the need for antibiotics. This can be achieved by measures such as continuing to hold food standards to the highest level, ensuring animal safety through protection from infection, and mitigating against environmental changes that can cause epidemics to develop. The second is to, is to ensure that their use is optimised and only used when necessary, and programmes such as the aforementioned SPSP are vital for educating healthcare professionals on this matter. But I think, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary said, we all need to take personal responsibility about when we may need antibiotics, when our children or other dependents may need antibiotics, and, of course, our pets. The final way, I, I think, is for the Scottish Government to continue to invest in expert research on the topic of, of AMR, as well as basic research, specialised research into new therapeutics, diagnostics and best practice will be invaluable for our continued fight against um, this, this looming issue and problem, or should I say current problem. Um, in 2018, at the start of the last parliamentary term, I had done some work with Christine Bond from the University of Aberdeen, who amongst her many titles was the trustee of the Antibiotic Research UK, and um, there's a number of issues that she put forward. She put forward that there was a test that can actually show whether um, whether antibiotics will work or not, and was questioning why uh, health authorities around uh, the world were not using this. And she also has done quite a lot of research in probiotics, and I think that her work is something to be looked at by the Scottish Government and others going forward if they've not already done so. Presiding officer, I can see that I'm over time. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to speak in this uh, very, very important debate. And these are some of the things that I think the Scottish Government and the NHS have done very well, but we'll need to continue this excellent work um, to challenge this problem as we move into the future. Thank you. Thank you. I call David Torrance to be followed by Julian Mackay. Uh, Mr Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. Antimicrobial resistance has emerged as one of the most serious public health issues of the 21st century posing a threat to effective prevention and treatment of an ever-widening range of infections caused by bacteria, parasites, virus and fungi that are no longer susceptible to common medicines. Antibiotic resistance in bacteria makes the problem of AMR even more important. 
Bacteria that causes common or serious infections have developed a resistance to each new antibiotic that comes to the market over sev several decades to variable degrees. Faced with that fact, we must all take action to advert a global health crisis, not just here in Scotland, but worldwide. We have heard warnings from the Wellcome Trust that without effective antimicrobial drugs, many of the routine surgeries could become life-threatening, with common infections becoming untreatable. Several fields of modern medicine that every single one of us takes for granted depend on the availability of effective antibiotic drugs, including hip replacements, intensive care for preterm babies, chemotherapy for cancer, treatment, organ transplantations, these along with many other act activities could not be performed without effective antibiotics. The economic impact of antibiotic resistance is difficult to assess, as a number of far-reaching consequences must be taken into account. For example, increased resistance leads to elevated costs associated with more expensive antibiotics, specialised equipment, longer stays in hospital and isolation procedures for patients. In the 2015 review of antimicrobial resistance estimated that the failure to act on AMR would result in 10 million lives being lost each year to drug-resistant strains of malaria, HIV, TB and certain bacterial infections by 2050 at a cost to the world economy of US$100 trillion. This is a further compounded by startling figures estimated by a World Bank group that estimates that an additional 28 million people could be forced into extreme poverty by 2050 through shortfalls in economic output unless the resistance is contained. The World Health Organization has declared antimicrobial resistance to be one of the top 10 global public health threats facing humanity. With the numbers like these, it is clear to see why. The symptomatic misuse and overuse of antimicrobial drugs such as antibiotics, is widely believed to be one of the main drivers for microbes developing antimicrobial resistance. The inappropriate use of antibiotics is also a factor, particularly self-medication, as it is almost always involves unnecessary, inadequate and ill-timed dosing, which then creates an ideal environment for microbes to adapt rather than be eradicated. It also recognises that a substantial percentage of the total use occurs outside the field of human medicine. With the use of antibiotics in food-producing animals and in agriculture, a major contributor to the overall problem of resistance. The One Health approach to tackling AMR, adopted in Scotland in 2016, acknowledges and addresses that health of humans, animals and environment are interconnected and that an efficient approach to tackling issues must be coordinated and a nationwide effort seen to. The UK five-year action plan for antimicrobial resistance in 2019-24, to which supports the UK 20-year vision of antimicrobial resistance and is contributed to by the Scottish Government and the NHS Scotland, recognises that AMR cannot be eradicated. The plan focuses on three key aims to tackle AMR, reducing the burden of infection, optimising the use of antimicrobials and developing new diagnostic therapies, vaccines and interventions with a core ambition of a world in which AMR is contained, controlled and mitigated. The establishment of the Scottish One Health National AMR Action Plan Group, led by Health Protection Scotland, to coordinate the delivery of a UK five-year national plan, has seen research undertaken to better understand the risk factors for acquisition and the outcome of certain resistant organisms, as well as the research into effectiveness on inter interventions aimed to drive behavioural change around antimicrobial use. Globally and at home, the progress of AMR is hugely encouraging. Initiatives such as Scotland's world-leading patient safety programme are delivering substantial results for which our NHS Scotland staff must be commended. In conclusion, President Officer, I welcome the significant work that is already underway to develop new evidence-based interventions to prevent in inter infections decreasing the need for the use of antimicrobials and in turn reducing the potential for the development of resistance. I also applaud the commitment to those working to contain and control AMR within our NHS and across the health sectors in Scotland. This slow-burning pandemic affects every one of us. Globally, nationally and locally, awareness must be continued to be raised that we all have a role to play in sustain action to prevent antibiotics and reduce drug-resistant infections to secure future delivery of our health care. Thank you. I now call Gillian Mackay, who is joining us remotely, to be followed by John Mason. Ms Mackay. This is a global concern, and my contribution today will largely focus on the global situation. 
It threatens our ability to treat common infections and could lead to the rapid spread of so-called superbugs that cause infections that are not treatable with existing antibiotics. According to a report published in January on the global burden of bacterial antimicrobial resistance, in 2019 there were an estimated 4.95 million deaths associated with bacterial antimicrobial resistance, including 1.27 million deaths direct, directly attributable to bacterial AMR. The World Health Organization has warned that not enough new antimicrobials are being developed and that a lack of access to quality antimicrobials remains a major issue. Antibiotic shortages are affecting con countries and healthcare systems all over the world. The UK government's five-year strategy states that antimicrobials are crucial medicines in modern, modern healthcare, yet up to two billion people still lack access to them. For most antimicrobials, there are few replacements or, or alternatives being developed, and according to the UK government, research and development of the vaccines, diagnostics, tools and tests needed to prevent infections is similarly lacking. The WHO has highlighted the greater innovation and investment is required in research and development of new antimicrobial medicines, vaccines and diagnostic tools, and the UK government must provide greater support for this as a priority. The cost of antimicrobial resistance to both healthcare systems and patient care is significant, as it means more prolonged hospital stays and more expensive and intensive care. If we do not tackle AMR, more people will be pushed into poverty. While it is true that AMR is a global problem that affects all countries regardless of borders, it does not affect every country equally. Studies have shown that the burden is disproportionately higher in low-income and middle-income countries, and we have a responsibility to act. High rates of resistance against, against antibiotics, often used to treat common bacterial infections, have been observed globally, and this indicates that we are running out of effective antibiotics. A well-known example of a bacterium that is resistant to a number of antibiotics is MRSA, which has caused infections that are difficult to treat across the world. As we have already heard this afternoon, antibiotic resistance is not just purely a health issue. Evidence and research papers are continuing to be published on the impacts of routine antibiotic use in farming. This can expose people to antibiotic, resi antibiotic resistant microorganisms through contaminated food or water. While routine antibiotic use is less prevalent in Scotland, it should be kept in mind when scrutinising trade deals that the UK Government is seeking post-Brexit. This is also not just confined to terrestrial farming practices. Globally, aquaculture is also an increasing contributor to antibiotic use. According to an article in Nature by Shar et al entitled Global Trends in Antimicrobial Use in Aquaculture, and I quote, global antimicrobial consumption in aquaculture in 2017 was estimated at 10,259 tonnes. While antimicrobial use in Europe is likely to reduce by 2030, in Africa, for example, it is likely to increase. We need to ensure that sufficient protein sources can be produced in developing nations to meet nutritional needs while tackling the global issue of antimicrobial resistance. So this makes this a social justice issue as well as a health one. <coughs> Excuse me. Release of antibiotics or the metabolites into the environment could increase the emergence of antibiotic genes. This release could be from hospitals, agricultural runoff, for example, and could enter the food chain or water system. Antibiotic resistant organisms can also follow the same path. A paper by Shar et al. in Nature published in 2020 says these types of environments become likely hotspots for the development of new antibiotic resistant genes. Humans come into contact with resistant microorganisms through numerous routes, including consumption of contaminated foods, interactions with animals and within contaminated environments. Ensuring that we minimise antibiotic use and explore other therapeutic avenues will hopefully reduce the instances of these interactions. Antiviral drug resistance is also an increasing concern amongst immunocompromised patients, as resistance has developed to most antivirals. Without the tools to prevent and treat drug-resistant infections, more treatments will fail and medical procedures will become more risky. While new antimicrobials are needed now, if the way we currently use antibiotics does not change, then they will suffer the same fate as existing ones. Antibiotics have saved millions of lives since they were first invented. We must act now to ensure that treatment with antibiotics remains effective now and for generations to come. 
Thank you. I now call John Mason to be followed by Stephanie Callaghan. Uh, Mr Mason. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak in this debate. I am happy to confess that this is not my main area of expertise, uh, either from my professional background or since I came into Parliament. However, where I did first come across this subject was when I lived in Nepal in the 1980s, uh, both in relation to leprosy and TB. Uh, so I am focusing on the world aspect uh, mentioned in the motion. I, I wel very much welcome the fact the Cabinet Secretary mentioned Ghana in his opening speech. Leprosy was fairly common in Nepal, and I think for both it and TB, there was and is a problem with people not completing the course of their treatment, and therefore not being cured while also building up resistance. And this was entirely understandable, as people were having to pay for drugs, many from a very poor background. So it was not surprising that when symptoms receded, they did not continue with the treatment they could ill afford. Money was very tight in the hospital in Tansen, where I worked, and we had to assess people before they got treatment, as sometimes richer people would turn up disguised as poor in order not to have to pay. I understand that over the last 20 years, global numbers of new leprosy cases have remained stable, irrespective of available tr effective treatment. In 1981, the WHO recommended multi-drug therapy against leprosy, and in 1996, the first case of primary multi-drug resistance was reported. Reports of mycobacterium lepri resistance rates have ranged from 2 per cent to 16 per cent, while an Indian study of 239 relapses and 11 new cases found 21.6 per cent of cases to be drug resistant and 6.8 per cent to be multidrug resistant. On tuberculosis, the TB Alliance reports that about 29 per cent of deaths are caused by antimicrobial infections are due to – sorry, 29 per cent – of deaths caused by antimicrobial infections are due to drug-resistant TB. There are over half a million cases of drug-resistant TB each year, either because of the somewhat complex drug regimen is improperly administered or when people with TB stop taking their medicines before the disease has been fully eradicated from their body. Treating a single case of multi-drug-resistant TB or extensively drug-resistant TB can be thousands of times more expensive than drug-sensitive TB. In South Africa, drug-resistant TB consumed 32 per cent of South Africa's $218 million national TB budget, despite accounting for only 2 per cent of all cases. Some of these figures I quote, I quote, I think, are slightly out of date, but to give a comparison, eh, for a drug-sensitive TB case, the cost is something like $260. For multi-drug-resistant TB, $7,000, and for extensively drug-resistant TB, $27,000. Clearly, antimicrobial resistance has a worldwide impact. It affects all areas of health, as others have said, and involves many sectors as an impact on the whole of society. It is a drain on the global economy, with economic losses due to sickness of both humans and animals, along with higher costs of treatments. And just as we have seen with the availability of COVID vaccines, that is likely to mean that the poorest countries suffer most. There now seems to be a global consensus that antimicrobial resistance poses a threat to humanity and could, following the pandemic, be the defining health issues of our time. I have seen the figure of 700,000 people a year dying due to antimicrobial resistance, although over one million has been mentioned in this debate already. And that shows the need for a united approach across the world to tackle such a complex problem. The WHO considers that this issue is one of the top ten global public health threats, as several others have said in this speech, in this debate. If allowed to continue, procedures such as caesarean sections, hip replacements, cancer chemotherapy and organ transplantation will all become riskier. And the 2015 review on antimicrobial resistance estimated that if we fail to act in AMR, an additional 10 million lives could be lost each year from drug-resistant strains of malaria, HIV, TB, etc. by 2050. The Scottish Government's action plan accepts that AMR cannot be eradicated, but the core ambition is that it should be contained, controlled and mitigated. So, in conclusion, I fully accept the focus of this Government and this Parliament is rightly on Scotland. However, just as, COVID, as with COVID, one country cannot deal with antimicrobial resistance in isolation, and as one of the world's richer nations, we have a responsibility to work with our partners worldwide and not least with our closest partners 
in Malawi, Zambia and Rwanda. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call Stephanie Callaghan, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Callaghan. Thank you, President Officer. Like my colleagues, I want to discuss the momentous global challenge that anti antimicrobial resistance, AMR, presents in an evolving world. I will attempt to limit repetition, but there will be some. In 2022, we faced the imminent danger of climate arm Armageddon. The recent IPCC report outlines that current plans to address climate change are not ambitious enough to avoid catastrophic events. We also continue to fight the COVID pandemic, a global health crisis that is far from over. And these existential threats exacerbate inequality, poverty and displacement, and they tie directly into the battle against AMR. Presiding officer, anti an why can I not say this and everyone else can? Antimicrobial resistance is not a new challenge, nor is it something in the horizon. It is with us now, today. As with the climate and COVID, scientists have been raising the flag of concern for years, but we have not yet seen robust mitigations or the necessary global leadership. We have recently got the data from the Global Research on Antimicrobial Resistance Study, showing that deaths associated with AMR are the third leading cause of death globally. A few members have already mentioned that right now, this year, up to 700,000 people will die from antibiotic resistance and infections across the world. And that figure is worth repeating again and again. The latest report from the UK Surveillance Programme for Antimicrobial Utilisation and Resistance tells us that antibiotic resistance has increased by 4.9% in the last four years. COVID has taught us that preparation is absolutely key and that inaction is abdication. Failure to act now means that countless families will be grieving in the future. So what is needed? First, we need a strong system for monitoring the impact of rising AMR here in Scotland. I know the Scottish Government has been looking into recording AMR or antibiotic resistance as a cause of death, and I would welcome an update from the Cabinet Secretary on where we are with data recording. Secondly, we need to slow start slowing the increase of AMR through strengthened infection prevention and control, enhanced hygiene and improved sanitation. As Emma Roddick said earlier today, washing our hands really is absolutely key. Scotland's world leading patient safety programme is an excellent foundation for managing AMR. For example, in Scotland, infection from C. diff and the MRSA dramatically reduced in over 65s by 88% and 94% under this SNP government. Thirdly, we need to have initiatives to address the systematic misuse and overuse of antibiotics, which is resulting in microbes developing antimicrobial resistance. Worldwide, the food sector needs to urgently listen to the WHO and their calls for work farmers and the food industry to stop using antibiotics routinely to promote growth and prevent disease in healthy animals. And going back to the overuse, my colleague John Mason hits the nail on the head with his comments on TB and leprosy. A further challenge is the severe lack of research and develop, development of new antimicrobials. The way pharmaceutical companies operate, dependent on sales for returns and investment, is not conductive to addressing AMR. The UK's pilot scheme, introducing a fixed fee model to finance the development of new antibiotics, is innovative and encouraging. If we're to respond to the existential threat from AMR, we need a global scientific response. The rapid development of COVID vaccines shows us what really is possible, and we can and we must remove constraints and collaboration between scientists. I am encouraged that Scotland has adopted a One Health approach to tackling EMR since 2016. The acknowledgement that the health of humans, animals and the environment are interconnected is really vital. Presiding officer, I will close by recognising those who do tireless work in this issue. The scientists and public health experts have already achieved so much in the fight to hold back the next pandemic. But they cannot fight this war alone. They need the backing of legislators, big pharma and individuals to make sure that this time we prepare properly for the next pandemic. That absolutely will happen if we do not put the right steps in place. Thank you. Thank you. And we will now move to closing speeches. And I call on Carol Mochan to wind up on behalf of Scottish Labour. Ms Mochan. 
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And may I thank everyone who has contributed to this debate so far for their very important and engaging contributions. I must, however, note my disappointment that we are no longer discussing long COVID as planned, a debate that I believe is of utmost importance and one that we need to take place soon. Tens of thousands of people across Scotland are believed to be suffering from this, and we must speak about it in this chamber. I have heard, uh, obviously, what the Cabinet Secretary has said, but I do not think the Government have given us a sufficient reason for why the subject of this debate was changed, and that should be noted by the Parliament. Uh, now, returning to the important issue of antimicrobial resistance. In closing this debate, I would like to reiterate some of the important points made and sum up my own party's view on this important issue, issue for, the front, for the future of the country. So from, colleague, from, so from my own colleague, uh, Jackie Bailey and uh, Emma Roddick, uh, they both mentioned that there is some very good news around, and that is most welcome. Uh, Realising that there is re reduction in use in many places, and of course, uh, we are man managing to prevent many more of uh, the infections that are around. Emma Roddick also gave a, a, an excellent speech about how we try to look at prevention first and make sure that we have the right messaging and the right training in place for that. And I thank you uh, for that speech. I thought it was, it was very good. It, it was an excellent contribution. Um, Sandish Galhani, uh, of course, gave us some of the history. He was the first to give us some of the history. Many other members mentioned the history of uh, antibiotics. Um, and in actual fact, I think the comment about it being a game changer is very important. And that is why we have to um, take this issue very seriously. The number of deaths associated with um, the loss of antibiotics and their function would, as many members have mentioned, uh, be a dreadful step backwards. TB was mentioned in particular, um, that they have increased um, and that we are unlikely to meet our to global targets unless we really do something about it. So, as a number of my colleagues have remarked, Scottish Labour really welcome the efforts to address the risk of antimicrobial resistance, both in Scotland and around the world. And it's important we recognise that any attempts to do this must take place on a UK-wide basis and indeed globally. The rapid development of the COVID vaccine was a great example of just how much can be done in record time when nations work together with common purpose. And that is the attitude we should move forward with. <clears throat> As we all know, any progress in the health, health field begins with well-funded and effective research. And antimicrobial resistance is no different. Ensuring the long-term support, support for this research is a vital step we must take in order to prevent the effect, preserve the effectiveness of antibiotics and key medicines for years to come. The Scottish Government should be doing all it can to support the many universities across Scotland doing this work so we can play our part in the promising international work on antimicrobial resistance. And I'm afraid at the moment this is not as good a, a, a case as it could be. Unfortunately, Scotland trails behind England in terms of funding, with a third less per head of the population devoted to clinical research of this kind. The British Heart Foundation estimates that without charitable funding, government and other public bodies would need to increase direct funding by 73 per cent to make up for that shortfall. That does not sound to me like it is a priority for this government, and that needs to change. If we want to be world leading, we have to put in uh, the funds to do that. It is with this in mind that my party is calling for the Scottish Funding Council to be tasked with a review of domestic and global funding streams available to Scottish universities and research groups so that we can effectively contribute to the global research efforts into antimicrobial resistance and the avenues available throughout the UK and internationally um, and international research uh, partnerships. As we have heard from other members today, effective prescribing has a role to play in preventing the risk of antimicrobial resistance too. But the Health Committee report into supply and demand of medicines across NHS Scotland from last year was very critical of the progress that has been made in improving prescribing practices in Scotland by the Government. In particular, the Committee was very critical of the inability of the NHS in Scotland to collect data on the outcomes of medicine use of patients, which, of course, will make it much more difficult to better understand antimicrobial resistance. 
and that prescribing in primary care makes up the bulk of our NHS medicine spend. Despite there being ineffective monitoring of these medicines, eh, whether medicines reviews are being carried out with patients. Again, this does not sound like it is the kind of foundation we want if we are to push ahead with tackling eh, the antimicrobial resistance. Um, and as the Cabinet Secretary says, um, these things have to change, and my party want to fully support the efforts to do this. So, in closing, Presiding Officer, I would like, again like to reiterate that Though this debate was useful and some very important, uh, and I, I, I would say I did learn a, a, a lot, it was very useful, it is disappointing that after months of evading the question of, of support for long COVID uh, patients, you know, uh, support for long COVID patients, the government still have no answer or solution in place that could give thousands of people some peace of mind. I think this habit that we've developed here in sort of kicking the can down the road um, and hiding behind unpublished reports is not a healthy one. And it really is time that we started to reconsider the way in which we do business and discuss in the chamber the true priorities of the population, of the people, not simply that that suits the government at that particular moment in time. So thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I now call on Sue Webber to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Ms Webber. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I would just like to echo the comments just made by uh, my Labour colleague, Carol Mocken, there. Antibiotics are one of the most powerful tools in healthcare, underpinning every aspect of modern medicine. We need them not just when we are poorly at home with an infection, but when we are going through significant life-changing procedures such as chemotherapy, hip and knee replacements. Antibiotics work by killing bacteria, but in the same way that the COVID-19 virus mutates and evolves, so can bacteria, developing resistance to antibiotics. Antimicrobial resistance poses a substantial threat to human health. It is estimated that by 2050, AMR could claim as many as 10 million lives a year worldwide, more than cancer and diabetes combined. Michael Mara made those points earlier too. Already, AMR infections are causing an estimated 700,000 deaths each year globally, while in the UK it is estimated that AMR causes at least 12,000 deaths per year. It's not a vague threat that's happening elsewhere. It's happening in the UK, and it's getting worse, and will continue to do so. Professor Jennifer Rohn from University College London has said that AMR has very much not gone away and in the long term, the consequences of AMR will be far more destructive. Although we have seen a welcome decline in total antibiotic use across the UK and Scotland, their use continues to increase in hospitals. The good news is a great deal of action is underway. The O'Neill report commissioned by David Cameron was groundbreaking. It was a highly influential around the world and 135 countries have finalised action plans on tackling AMR. Last year, it was very welcome that the UK government has been using their G7 presidency to try and deliver more tangible progress as they did last time they held the presidency in 2013. But as Mr. Dr. Gohani rather said, there are only 40 antibiotics, new novel antibiotics that are in current clinical trials, and that should concern us all. The UK government is working with the devolved administrations to tackle AMR effectively, including through the National Five-Year Action Plan. The Five-Year National Action Plan, developed in conjunction with the devolved administrations, identifies three ways to fight AMR. Reducing the need for and the unintentional exposure to antimicrobials, optimising the use of antimicrobials and investing in innovation, supply and access. Alongside its five-year strategy, the UK Government also published a long-term ambition for AMR. This document set out a vision of a world in which antimicrobial resistance is effectively contained, controlled and mitigated, and it laid out nine ambitions for the UK to continue to be a good global partner, to drive innovation, minimise infection, provide safe and effective care to patients, protect animal health and welfare, minimise environmental spread, support, support sustainable supply and access, demonstrate appropriate use and engage the public. And with that, I'd like to uh, just mention uh, Ms Roddick's comments. A reminder to us all that antibacterial agents do not impact on viruses. 
and she also reiterated when antibiotics are not useful. In July 2019, the government announced that its investments in combating AMR included £32 million of capital funding to support AMR research. This includes £19.1 million for AMR research at four National Institutes for Health Research Biomedical Centres and £8.8 .8 million for two NIHR health protection research units on healthcare associated affections and antimicrobial resistance. The UK is also working internationally on AMR. In September 2019, the Department of Health and Social Care announced a £6.2 million package of funding to strengthen existing surveillance systems tracking AMR trends across Africa and Asia. In the 2019 manifesto, Conservatives pledged to turn our attention to the great challenges of our time, including solving antibiotic resistance. To do this, we committed to do the fastest ever increase in domestic public R&D spending to meet our target of 2.4% of GDP being spent on R&D across the economy. Some of this new spending will go on a new agency for high-risk, high-payoff research at arm's length from government. And furthermore, at last year's autumn budget and spending review, the UK government increased public R&D investment to record levels. And this equates to 20 million by 2024-2025, which is why it is important that we really reinforce the cooperation globally and across the UK, and why a Scottish approach is unnecessary. But we will do the same as the rest of the world, and why we will support the Labour uh, motion and amendment today, because we need to reinforce the gap between Scotland and England in funding. And we need to come up to and match what's been done elsewhere. We have to play our equal part. The progress we have seen in, in recent years is welcome, especially the UK government's new subscription-style payment model for antimicrobials, which will incentivise companies to invest in this area. The new subscription-style payment model is a win-win for both healthcare systems and industry. It demonstrates that NHS patients can benefit from a secure supply of new antimicrobial drugs, drugs, while pharmaceutical companies can reliably forecast their return on investment. And to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, this is a serious issue and one we must continue to work together on. It is heartening to see the UK Government taking positive steps to ensure that action is not only being taken now, but putting plans in place for the future. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Marie Todd, uh, Minister, to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Government. Thank you. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. My colleague has vividly described why we must keep antibiotics working when modern medical procedures are so reliant on the ability to treat bacterial infections. The threat posed by antimicrobial resistance mustn't be underestimated, and we can't afford to be complacent in our response to this risk. I look forward very much to debating long COVID in a few weeks' time, but I have to say as a pharmacist and indeed a legal prescriber, as Sandesh Kalhani would say, I have spent my professional life promoting the rational use of medicines and good stewardship of antibiotics, and I welcome the opportunity for this Parliament to give its attention to this global threat. Certainly. Jackie Bailey. I, I absolutely agree with her about the importance of this. Could she maybe explain to the Chamber why in the past six years there has not been one government debate about this? Minister. So that's actually in the past 23 years, is it 23 years, since we had devolution there has been no debate on this and I for one am absolutely delighted. I was reflecting on my, er, my years Delete, delighted that we are finally debating antimicrobial resistance. Indeed, when I was at university as a student, my honours project was on antibiotic uh, prophylaxis in caesarean section. Jackie Bailey. Certainly. The record will reflect that there were debates on C. diff, MRSA, a whole variety of different um, diseases that were caused as a result of antimicrobial resistance. Minister. 
specific topic of EMR. And in fact, I was going to highlight that C. diff in my days, because I am decades beyond being qualified, in my days at university, C. diff was called antibiotic-associated colitis. And that just shows you the change in perception over the decades. And actually, I'm very proud that Scotland has made such massive progress in treating that particular um, hospital healthcare acquired infection. We need to recognise that AMR isn't something that just affects humans, though. Bacteria with the potential to become resistant to antibiotics exist in animals and in the environment, too. And for that reason, a One Health approach to this threat is required. This recognises that the health of people is closely connected to the health of animals and our shared environment. In short, we cannot tackle AMR in humans in isolation. And I want to step outside my usual brief to say more about this. The Scottish Government committed to a One Health approach to combat AMR. In 2015, as Ms Bailey has said, we formed the Scottish Animal Health and Antimicrobial Resistant Group. This forum features representation from government, from industry bodies and both human health and veterinary sectors, truly encompassing our One Health vision. It provides leadership and it engages with key stakeholders in a coordinated, quality-driven approach to anti-AMR measures, including promoting good infection prevention and control practice for animal keepers, improving veterinary prescribing practice for both pets and livestock, learning from the data we have on AMR in animal populations. A vital tool in tackling AMR is a coherent, consistent advice for the animal keeping public including farmers and pet owners. And we've established the Scotland's Healthy Animals website to centralise guidance for animal keepers and veterinary professionals and to promote responsible antimicrobial stewardship. Monitoring levels of antimicrobial usage and rates of resistance is also essential. And to that end, as my colleague mentioned earlier, NHS Scotland produces an annual Scottish One Health antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance report. This provides information on the use of antibiotics by humans and in veterinary practices in Scotland and levels of antibiotic resistance found in a range of important human and animal infections and in the environment. Bacteria of particular interest are those which can potentially transfer between animals and humans, including bacteria which are common causes of food poisoning, such as Salmonella and E. coli. Now, whilst accepting that there is much more to do in the battle against AMR, achievements in terms of overall usage of antimicrobials in the animal sector should be acknowledged. Ongoing monitoring demonstrates an overall decline in usage of antibiotics in livestock species, and this is really significant and demonstrates the hard work of producers and veterinarians to safeguard the efficacy of our antibiotics. We also aim to harness the power of genomic technology, something which, thanks to the pandemic, we are all much more aware of, to identify and to track foodborne pathogens and antimicrobial resistant organisms through the agri-food system and the environment. I previously mentioned that One Health includes the wider environment in which humans and animals live. And that's why we've convened AMR in the Environment in Scotland Stakeholders Group including representation from the Scottish Environmental Protection Area. And this, in this, I'll address um, some of the points that were made in, uh, around research. So the Scottish Government is fully engaged with the research programme within the National Action Plan and across research categories of evidence generation, implementation, evaluation, coordination and guidance. Active government funded research is going on in many areas, including food safety research, sustainable investment, environmental contamination and diagnostics. And I'm going to highlight just one of the environmental contamination research projects that goes on. Our efforts to combat AMR in the environment have led to the formation of the One Health Breakthrough Partnership, an initiative which is based in the Highlands to address the issue of environmental pharmaceutical contamination. And this unique partnership is driven by NHS Highland, by Scottish Water and the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency and the Environmental Research Institute. Scottish universities and research institutions generate a significant contribution to AMR research. We've ensured the breadth of this contribution is captured 
by commissioning a register of all Scottish One Health research into AMR from the previous five years, which we will be maintaining as an active, updated resource. And the register will continue to form our, inform our evidence-based policy making in the future. On the point that Michael Mara raised about the pandemic facing immediate challenges over the course of the last year, couple of years and derailing research, I would respond saying that whilst necessarily the pandemic has absolutely been at the forefront of everyone's mind for the last couple of years, there has undoubtedly been transferable learning from this episode in history. And we have seen absolute strides forward in infection protect, protect, prevention and control in all settings, hospitals and in care homes. And we have seen an astonishing level of global collaboration in everything from developing vaccinations um, to understanding genomic sequencing of new variants of virus, viruses. Certainly. Michael Mara. I appreciate the Minister have given way. I fully acknowledge the points she's making in terms of the, um, the, the potential benefits long term in terms of the changes to the research environment that she's describing, the collaboration that can take place. The, I wouldn't say that the uh, research agenda had been derailed, more that there had been a displacement process and that some uh, members of the research community have, have been doing other work in that project. If we're going to get back on track and actually accelerate that work, then I do think that the, uh, the review we've asked for and you've graciously um, agreed to with the SFC is critical to making sure that additional resource can be identified to allow that work to take place. Minister. Absolutely. I agree. That's a very fair point. We are committed to taking action on AMR throughout our work, including via international trade. And as the coronavirus pandemic has also demonstrated, diseases do not recognise national borders, and that is also true of AMR. As the UK embarks on trade negotiations with prospective third country trading partners, Scotland continually presses for measures to tackle the development and spread of AMR in all UK free trade agreements. My ministerial colleagues have written to their counterparts in the UK government several times to ensure that AMR is recognised during negotiations. I am really grateful to the experts in many areas who lead Scotland's efforts to contain and to control AMR. But as my colleague said in his opening speech, we can all help to support this work. For example, we can all listen to those who are treating us or our pets when they advise us that an antibiotic is not the best course of action. I myself at the moment am coughing furiously and I am living proof that antibiotics do not treat viruses. We, cannot, we can ensure, all ensure that we stay healthily hydrated, for example. That helps to reduce urinary tract infection and prevents the use of some antibiotics and the development of further complications. And we can all make sure that we never flush away unused medicines into the environment. Of course, as a pharmacist, I would say take them back to your pharmacy for safe disposal. My thanks to all of those who are working to control AMR in their daily life, whether in hospital or a GP surgery or a pharmacy or a lab or a farm or a veterinary surgery, a research institute or in many other settings. We recognise your efforts to keep our drugs working and we can all support you. In conclusion, we in Scotland are vigilant to the threat posed by AMR. We are ready to meet this challenge and we have made great strides forward, supported by experts and by the Scottish public. However, we must not become complacent. We must maintain our focus and energy on ensuring that our antibiotics continue to work. And to that end, we will continue to adopt a One Health approach, tackling AMR in humans side by side with protecting the environment that we exist in and protecting the animal and plant life that we share with it. Thank you. Share it with you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the Scottish approach to managing the global risk of antimicrobial resistance. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion 4074 on legislative consent motion, Health and Care Bill UK legislation. And I call on Hamza Youssef to move the motion. Move, presiding officer. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. 
and I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward to now, and I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you. The question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Therefore, there are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. And the first is that Amendment 4070.1, in the name of Jackie Bailey, which seeks to amend Motion 4070 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the Scottish approach to managing the global risk of antimicrobial resistance, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The amendment, rather, is therefore agreed. The next question is that Motion 4070, in the name of Hamza Youssef, as amended, on the Scottish approach to managing the global risk of antimicrobial resistance, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. And the final question is that Motion 4074, in the name of Hamza Youssef, on Health and Care Bill UK legislation, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. That concludes decision time, and I close this meeting.